like to talk a little bit. I was quite inspired by Ron uh, Hobson's uh, presentation this morning, where he spoke of the cultural, some of the cultural factors that make it, uh, that make the use of drugs, the use of psychiatric drugs with children in, in North America so popular. And that's what I'd like to focus on a little bit today and describe a little bit how I approach the study of uh, all medications, but particularly psychiatric medications, psychiatric drugs. As a social scientist, I don't just look at drugs as objects. I don't just look at drugs as pills, objects, concrete material objects that occupy physical space and that you just take into your body and that have physiological effects. I think that the social, psychological, interpersonal effects of drugs are just as important as, as their physical effects. And so um, I look, I approach the, the subject of, of drugs from a particular analytical approach. Um, as a social scientist, I first of all use a systemic approach. That is, I uh, look, I, a systemic approach places emphasis on complexity. It places emphasis on multiple causality, that different, different causes may cause the same phenomenon. Different. It uh, puts emphasis on uncertainty. People don't quite know what the future holds for them, and they make decisions based on unknown intentions from other people. And it also puts emphasis on change and evolution over time. And those are some of the principles I apply when I look at drugs, and I'll tell you how I apply that when I look at psychiatric medications and apply this to the use of medications in North America for some children. Then uh, the other piece of my approach is constructivist. And that's a, uh, you could say, philosophy of knowledge that places uh, emphasis on human beings as active constructors of their reality. Through language, through meaning, through experience, people shape their reality. They do it individually, and they do it as groups, and they do it as societies. And what they shape and what they create uh, comes to them to be normal, physical, or social facts that they do not question very much. And another piece of my analytical approach is critical. You could call that a critical approach. Many, many definitions of what a critical approach or critical theory is, but what it really comes down to is stepping outside the traditional ways of looking at an object of study. Generally, when drugs are studied, you look at doctors and patients. You look at the uh, drugs as a therapeutic object. And so the idea, to, when you want to step outside, you could look at drugs as commercial products. The fact that drugs are really manufactured by 15 countries that sell all of the world's drugs to all the other countries in the world. You could look at drugs as uh, vectors of uh, social control. That is, drugs are used to control people, to keep some people in their place and make them believe that they themselves have a problem inside them that requires medication. You could look at drugs as how they trigger personal change. Some people go through a crisis, they take antidepressants, and all of a sudden their whole life changes, they start thinking, uh, they have a spiritual sort of rebirth, or they begin to believe they have a brain disease. You could look at drugs as uh, just how people interface with their doctors. They're like the, 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 the center of why people talk to their, when they go see their doctor, the conversation for five minutes might be about drugs. You could look at drugs as what makes uh, drug companies and uh, insurance uh, companies and uh, regulatory agencies meet, come together and discuss. You could look at uh, drugs as uh, symbols, like an automobile is a symbol. It's not just a means of transportation, but it's a symbol of speed, it's a symbol of masculinity, it's a symbol of freedom. So you see, there are, an object is like, it's a multifaceted object. Depending on your standpoint, it can just sort of twirl like a diamond that reflects light. You can never quite catch it and figure out what exactly is this. So this is to introduce how one might approach as a social scientist medications besides approaching them as I have also spent most of my career approaching them as concrete material objects that have very powerful physical and psychological and cognitive effects on bodies, on brains, and on thinking and behaving. So one of the ways using this approach that you can begin to look at drugs is to understand that they have a life cycle, a very complex life cycle. And you could conceptualize this life cycle as beginning with some kind of conception. That somewhere in some lab, some people are conceiving 
or choosing or picking a molecule, which is not yet even called a drug or even a compound yet. It's just a molecule. It's got a name, a code. And the life cycle of a drug moves through a number, a whole bunch of different cycles. You can say very briefly, I'll go, you've got conception, you've got basic animal and so forth studies, basic studies on the physio on, on the uh, composition of that substance, on what it does to animals under certain conditions, on how many animals will die at what dose, etc. And then you've got the so-called clinical trials with a whole bunch of phases. That's another phase of the life cycle of a drug. Then you've got maybe at this time, maybe promotion efforts are beginning. Then you've got regulatory approval of the drug. Then you've got the mass market promotion of the drug. Then you've got the prescription of the drug in, in uh, situations involving doctors and patients and other professionals. Then you've got uh, new indications that may occur. Then you've got maybe withdrawal of the drug or then maybe it becomes over the counter and, and so forth and so on. It may be seen as a panacea or it may be seen as a panapathogen. It may be seen as a cure-all, or it may be then eventually be seen as a scourge. What I'm trying to say is there's a very complex life cycle, which is difficult to predict in individual cases. And the, there are impasses, bifurcations, hoops, leaps, and how, and there's a whole bunch of actors, different actors at every step, every cycle of that life cycle, every stage of the life cycle of a drug, there are transactions between different kinds of actors, most of whom stay in the dark, most of whom we rarely hear about. You've got financial investors, you've got not only doctors, patients, and nurses, and maybe pharmacists, you've got journalists. The media are probably the most important actor today in terms of why a drug gets used in a certain country. But yet their actions are rarely looked at scientifically as contributing to drug use. They're rarely looked at. We just sort of uh, uh, go, we take for granted that they have some kind of role, but researchers don't look at the media and analyze what is the media doing in the life cycle of drugs. You've got regulators in the FDA who then move from industry to government and back and forth. What are their motivations? How do they understand risk, therapy, harm? How do they work? What are the incentives and constraints on their behavior as they're going about their daily work. You've got school teachers, you've got parents, you've got lobby groups, you've got non-medical helping professionals, you've got a whole bunch of people who are involved in the life cycle of a drug as it moves through its life cycle. And so it's important not just to study the drug as it impacts doctors and patients, but to look at the actions of all these other actors in these different cycles of these different stages of a drug's life cycle. Now, that's called a biographical approach, if you will, to treat a drug as a sort of a living or evolving system that moves through phases with subsystems with a lot of different transactions. And the impact of an early, for example, the impact of the kinds of transactions that go on for example, as Peter Bregan has documented, when you've got negotiations going on between the drug company and the FDA people over the, what is exactly going to be the wording, the exact wording on the label for that drug, you see, this information is not available to the general publics and not available to most physicians and not available to most public health authorities. So that, you see, this is a piece of information that's not available. And so you know that what happens though, the transactions going on at that stage are deeply going to influence how the drug is perceived by doctors and patients in ordinary clinical situations. Yet that is a very important influence on how the drug will be prescribed and used and understood and reported and described. Yet the main cause of how the drug will be prescribed is just not available to researchers because it's kept secret. It's just not available. So a task of researchers is to actually should be to reveal some of this information to shed some light on the entire life cycle of drugs. Which brings me to how drugs can be treated entirely differently in different countries. And I'm going to, to use the example of France and the United States and Canada uh, with respect to Ritalin. Uh, 
Now, what I have started to do a couple of years ago, I've started to sort of embark on this, on this uh, uh, project where I'm studying about nine different countries uh, to see how the use of stimulants and psychiatric drugs generally, mostly antidepressants, anticonvulsants, with problem children differs from country to country and why it differs. I'm interested in the dynamics of why it's so different in the, Uni in the United States or Canada than in France with respect to the use of Ritalin. Like what happens? Who's doing what to whom such that there is much more, there, there are so many more prescriptions of Ritalin in the United States than in France. Let me just first start by giving you some couple of figures on how the diff, what is the difference? Now the difference is pretty astounding. I have the figures from Novartis Pharma, which makes Ritalin in, it's the only stimulant on the market, the only stimulant uh, on the market in France right now, the only psychostimulant prescribed to children is by Novartis Pharma. And, it's, and, and there's a requirement that uh, the, the data must be uh, reported every year to such an agency, uh, sort of equivalent of the FDA. And so I have the data from that French equivalent of the FDA and from Novartis Pharma. And in all of 1999, in the country of France, which is a country of about 60 million inhabitants, you had less than 5,500 children on Ritalin in all of France, 5,500 kids. Probably in one borough of New York, you've got 10,000 kids on Ritalin. Now, that is compared to easily three to four million children in this country on Ritalin. So the, it's, it's an astounding, astounding difference. Now, what happens? So um, what I do, and I've done this now with Canada, I'm doing it with France, and I have a bunch of countries that I've picked, like Hungary is one, Spain is another, Israel is another, Australia, and um, I believe, the, I forget, there's nine countries. The reason I've picked them is I've picked some countries where there is very, very little use, almost nil, like France, and some countries where it's growing very fast. Israel is one of those countries, for example. Spain is a country where the use is still, still very, very low, but rapidly changing. The UK is another country where the use of Ritalin is just growing by about 300% every year. It went from about 14,000 prescriptions about five years ago to about 192,000 prescriptions today. So it's just growing le leaps and bounds. Still very little compared to the United States, but extremely limited. So what I do basically is I just go there and I make contacts beforehand. And so on my, a year and a half ago, I did a, a study uh, trip to France and I met about 20 different people. Who did I meet? I met uh, about three school teachers. Uh, I just ask people, do you know a school teacher somewhere? I do this beforehand. I met, say, the head of the uh, uh, equivalent of the FDA. I met the president of Novartis. I met, uh, the, uh, I met three child psychologists. I met the uh, head of a parent's lobby group that lobbies to get Ritalin, well uh, Ritalin and uh, ADHD well recognized. I met a couple of medical journalists. I met a couple of pharmacists. I met a couple, uh, four or five child psychiatrists of different